So, hello and welcome back to Cornworks 4, Spielworks own small, cozy, friendly online gaming uh, convention. My name is Uli Blenemann and as usual, if you have questions and comments, please put them in the chat window. And it is my, really my pleasure having Cole Worley as my guest and I'm back personally in fanboy, fanboy mode again. So welcome Cole, how are you? I'm doing very well. I, uh, I'm sad that we're not, not going to be able to see you this year at Essen, because we won't be going, but this is, a, this is a, actually kind of a better substitute in some ways. In, in, in some ways, uh, yes, and um, I may, I uh, probably will travel to the U.S. next year, so hopefully, uh, again, so yeah. hopefully we'll meet over there, and I'm looking forward uh, to this. And um, Board Games for More is saying hi, and Mo, um, designer of the cost, is saying hello. So um, great seeing you, of course. Yeah. For the one or two people who do not know you, Cole, who is Cole Worley? What are you doing? <laughs> well, I am the creative director at Leader Games, and I do a lot of their, their game design as well. <clears throat> and Leader Games is a small, uh, well, I guess we've got 15 people, which is not hardly small anymore. We no. used to be a small uh, board game company uh, based in St. Paul, Minnesota, and then I'm the co-founder of Worley Game, which I run with my brother, Drew. Yeah, and, and I think um, these days 15 people is in the board gaming area is quite a, it's, it's definitely not a small company uh, yeah, at all. No. We'll have to change our tagline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And um, so today what we will do, we will first talk about leader games. And then later in about half an hour, we will add Drew, your brother, to this uh, stream and we will talk to Whirly Geek. But let's start with Leader Games. How was Leader Games year, your year uh, for at Leader Games, uh, Cole? Well, this was an interesting year for us because we did not release any new games. Um, and that was like somewhat done on purpose, but not not entire. I mean, it's one of those things that you know, occasionally projects don't go through, or things get canceled or moved yeah. around. You know, I always um, uh, someone asked me once, like uh, a reviewer was asking me, like, why why do game companies ever publish a game that isn't good? And I and I and I, I told them um, mostly it's because they didn't have the power to cancel it. Yeah. Uh, and, and and I think you know we were in a spot where we had a number of titles we were looking at, and none of them were just quite feeling right. And so we we decided to rearrange our priorities a little bit. And so early on in the year, we decided this would be a just a a, a research and development year mm -hmm. where we prepared for next year. So we have been it, it, even though we have not released anything this year, everyone on staff has been tremendously busy, and we have a full slate of games for for next year. Um, but we are working on new material for Oath, new material for Root, and then the, the main, and, and, and for Ahoy, and then the main thing that I've been working on is uh, completing ARCs, our big uh, science fiction game. Yeah, and we, we will talk about this in, in detail in just a, a few seconds. And board games for, for me already in the chat is saying, can't wait for ARCs. So, and, and by the way, hello uh, to Hans as well in Spieletreffen, uh, Verteiler. Nice meeting you. But what I found very interesting too, that you said they do not. Have, some companies do not have the power to cancel a project. I thought um, and I thought about it, and you are of course completely right. Sometimes it's the people working on the project. They do not feel that they should do it, so they never let others know in the organization. And sometimes, and this is a basic thing, a company needs money. So they yeah. need to release. So they do not have the power to simply say, no, we are not doing it. So if you have, and this term is, is totally wrong, if, if you do not have the luxury to do this, mm -hmm. then you are already uh, in, in a pretty bad, bad shape. So that, that I found interesting. But getting back to, to ARCs, what is ARCs, by the way? So ARCs has been really, um, ARCs is, the simple version is ARCs is our big science fiction game. Um, it's the project that I started working on right after Oath. Um, I mean, really, I think we had sent Oath to the factory. It had been there for two weeks, and then I started working on ARCs. And um, it, it is in some ways, though, it is, it's sort of a, a hybrid of problems that we were running into, both with Root and with Oath. I find that as a designer, I'm always working against myself. So when I finish a project, 
the next product I work on is almost always a direct reaction to the product I had just done, mm -hmm. all the things I was unhappy with. Uh, even when I'm happy with the game, there are always things that, that don't sit right. Uh, and so, you know, ARCs, ARCs kind of um, started from, from two premises. One of them is a problem in asymmetric design, mm -hmm. which is uh, as, so asymmetry is very expensive, as a, a, you know, uh, Uli, you know this, I mean, a, as the publisher of Root, uh, asymmetry costs a lot. It costs a lot of rules, it costs a lot of complexity, but players get immersion from it. There's yeah. something gained too. Yeah. And what I realized was as you pull those asymmetric positions up further and further apart, um, you're gaining storytelling, but you're losing gameplay. Yeah. Because if I am you know, trying to cure a disease and you're trying to lead an army, we don't have any interface. There's no gameplay between those positions. So even if our positions are interesting and narratively robust, yeah. we're not playing the same game. Yeah. So I started thinking about you know, one way we solve this is in Root, uh, it's fundamentally a war game. If everyone's playing a war game, then yeah. we have a good interface. But that means that there are certain stories that you just can't tell in Root. You can't really tell um, a robust uh, economic story or a robust narrative that doesn't have violence in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about what would a design look like um, that could actually stitch those asymmetric positions together. So that, that, was, that was kind of like question one. And then question two was, uh, Oath is a campaign style game that doesn't have any beginning or end. Mm -hmm. And that can be a very powerful um, prompt for, for a game, but it also means there's certain kinds of stories it can't tell. It can't tell sort of like curated dramatic arcs. And so I, um, in, in, in kind of thinking about these two prompts, I went to Patrick and asked, said, I would like to work on a game that tries to answer both of these questions. And the usual way these conversations go with Patrick, the, the company mm -hmm. founder, is I tell him, mm -hmm. I need to work for three or four months to even know if this is possible. And then once I start working on it more, I will start to get an idea of how long it will actually take to execute. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's funny because I never, I never really set out to like make a big game. I just say, okay, I, I do think it's possible. That was the, the first few months. And uh, it involved uh, engineering a kind of interesting card play uh, system that I can talk more about. And then... As we at, once we built that out, I realized that building the content was going to take about two and a half years, um, which is again um, at that point we have to ask as a company, our, you know, our, our studio has to ask, is this game right for us to publish? And we we always have have two tests, which is um, the game has to be uh, too resource intensive for a small company, um, and it also has to be too risky for a large company. Uh -huh. So if it's in that if it's in that uh -huh. valley. If, if it's too hard for a small company to make and too dangerous for an asthma day or a Hasbro yeah. to make, then it's perfect for us. Right. And so, and so Patrick looked at it and said, nope, this is exactly the kind of thing that we do. Take two years to work on it. And so we are now kind of ending that two-year period. I'm in the final weeks of completion right now. Excellent um, um, how you d describe this. I have to take a look at the chat here because some um, people are here. Maple Peter is um, doing a very uh, uh, short uh, thing. He's just saying, woohoo, uh, Cole. <laughs> that, that, that's always uh, good. And then there is Han. He's saying, just stopping by to wish you good luck in Essen. Okay, that's me. We are on holiday, so I cannot say hello next week. Best wishes to Cole as well. Our group loves Pax Pamir and John Company. Really looking forward to the German version of Arcs, okay? And Molly House looks very interesting as well. Best wishes. And Hans is saying thanks, Uli and Cole. I will see the rest of it later. Yeah, okay. Um, I have to play a game of Alma Mata. Playing games is also very uh, important. <laughs> yeah, very important. Um, and Pete came a little bit late because he's asking, will Cole be at Spiel this year? Unfortunately not. I'll miss yeah. him too. So hopefully next year. But Mo had a question. I think it's to this or still related to not having the power of killing a game, but maybe mm -hmm. Mo is correcting me. Is there a time when the game lost its window to make an impact, meaning that the industry or community community has advanced forward and the game has been stuck in development and lost relevance? Was this a factor Cole here for, for canceling a project or saying no we are not doing it? That's well, that's a great question because that does happen quite a bit. Um, our policy generally when we're working on new titles is that, is that they're never oriented towards market trends. So when when roll and rights became very popular, we did not 
many people pitched us Root as a roll and write or other yeah, asymmetric yeah, yeah, roll and write yeah. games. And we, we had no interest in doing it, in part because if we had to delay a project and we were trying to ride a market wave, then uh, we would have just had to throw away so much good creative work. And that's not, you know, that's not something that we're interested in. So uh, here's a, a funny example of that in practice. Um, ARCs happens to have a kind of trick-taking chassis. It, it's built around a, a, a card play system that is a little bit like trick-taking. Um, I started working on it way before trick-taking became the, the, the thing that games had. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that by the time the game comes out, that fad will have passed. But ARCs... <laughs> doesn't rely on it being a trick taker. It's not, okay. you know, I, I never, I, I don't, I try to have little, um, little, uh, you know, I, I don't want to hang the whole design on one me me mechanical yeah. hook. Um, I, you know, when we, when we're, when we're canceling games, um, so first of all, I should say, uh, I cancel my own games about as much as I cancel the games of other folks. Uh, it happens a lot. And the biggest reason is you just start feeling like if we work really hard, this game will be okay. Or it, it won't be remarkable, or it won't like I I want to think that we should only be publishing games that have like a real sense of urgency to them, uh, and then sometimes games don't work out for reasons like totally out of the control of anyone else. Like we have yeah. a partnership, and for some reason that partnership has to fall apart, or there's a change in policy, and there's like nothing actually wrong with the design. And the last reason, and probably the most common reason that games get canceled, is um, we look at it and we just decide that it needs more time. And so we say, you know what, let's put this one on ice and go work on something else. And I mean, that was something that happened to John Company a lot. I mean, I, John Company took a lot of breaks from design, right? Work on it for a few months. It wasn't working. I would put it away for a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if if um, if really good, we're in a, a worse financial position, it, it, we would have to kind of make that a hard calculation yeah. about do we just get this to market knowing that an OK game will keep us alive? And yeah. uh, but our, the way I, the way we try to design our business plans is basically to avoid having to ever have that happen. Um, and it, it's one reason why Drew and I are like very careful about growth because as soon as we have three or four staff operating with us, then we have to start making those compromises. Of, of course, I, I, I totally get this as a small uh, company publisher. So it makes tremendous sense. And Mo, uh, getting back to trick taking, he's saying it's a golden age of trick taking. Yes, so many great trick taking games but it will, actually today in an earlier stream I, when i talked to ella we were talking about trick takers and uh, she asked me what are your favorite trick takers mm. and i said well i even love games that use trick taking as a tool for example like brian boru i have mm -hmm. I, i don't I, i don't think it's a perfect game but pia silvestas a game where but where it's a, a tool so if arx is using trick taking as one of the hooks and as a tool for implementing results this is wonderful so please tell us more about that code so arcs uh the kind of uh the the, the trick taking came from a couple different sources in arcs one of them was um from a storytelling perspective um games pop up in stories all the time and i come from a, a background studying lit And so I've, I've read a lot of, you know, books in the 18th and 19th century. And you see games as metaphors occasionally. Usually it's chess, but much more commonly than chess is poker and whist and yeah. trick-taking games. Yeah. And that's because the flow of a trick-taking game is so dramatic. There's a mathematical term for it I, that I don't have uh, quite at hand, but it's it has to do with the variance of the, the, I think it's called like the, the strategic um, complexity of a trick taker. It, it's outrageously high. In, yeah. in chess, a, a queen is always, almost always a powerful piece. Mm -hmm. But in a trick taking game, uh, a three of clubs might be very powerful yes. and, and, and an ace might be very powerful or, or horrible. Yeah. And, and, and it's that flexibility that lends the game to all these lovely uh, dramatic turns and twists. It, it feels like it has, it has a beat to it, which I really like. Um, And, and what, I, what I thought about was, you know, when, we were, when I was working on Oath, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how players compose stories in their mind while they're playing the game. So, so Root, for instance, every player's turn in Root is about the same length. Mm -hmm. So even though there are different steps, they take about a minute to resolve usually. And Oath, the turns are longer. And we experimented with shorter turns in Oath, but it didn't, it didn't uh, players couldn't remember the games. It reminded me of... Um, Like so there are some brilliant euros which I which I adore, but which have very small actions, 
Mm-hmm. And when you play them, you get sucked right into them. I mean, 18 xxs are like that, or yeah. Hatsune Tanaka, or those games like that. Mm-hmm. That you get sucked right into the game. But at the end of the game, it's hard to remember what happened because you were so engaged in the small decision. And so with Oath, we made the turns longer because we felt like players were composing stories and it allowed them to compose a paragraph at a time. And what I wanted with with arcs was something more cinematic, something where, you know, if we're in a four player game and really you and I are in a conflict, we can have a very quick cross cutting b- b- between our, our tempo and our position. And then we can kind of hibernate and, and let other players sort of like take, mm-hmm. take, take the, uh, to take the stage. And I think trick taking kind of allowed us to do it. Uh, the other thing I, I noticed when I was working on arcs was um, a lot of the games I work on are very action scarce. Premiere, you're always, you always want the third action. Premier. Mm-hmm. You can almost never have it. Uh, and, and so much of Premiere is about engineering those chains of free actions to, yes. to win the game. Um, and so arcs, I had this idea that like, what if, if I, when I was dealing out hands, I was dealing players 15 actions. But they could start to spend their actions to do the thing they wanted to at the time when it wasn't allowed. So if you lead a suit that's about movement, it's very easy to move around. There are lots of movement actions sloshing around. But if you really have to battle or if you really have to secure some card from the market, you can do that, but it's going to cost you actions. Mm-hmm. And that, that gives the game a very uh, kind of action-rich feel mm-hmm. um, that then, and, and this is kind of like the last, the last point about how the trick-taking works, is because players are then competing in this action system, uh, even if we are trying to do different things, we are always having to attend to the card play. There's no way of getting around it. And that's, mm-hmm. and that's something, you know, I think Brian Brew does a pretty good job of it. Um, and Brian Brew, you know, I, I love Paris games so much. Yes. He's one, mm-hmm. one of my favorite designers. And uh, Brian Brew is one of those games that I wish were like 20% meaner. I feel like in development, it got, it went like 20% in the wrong direction for my own personal taste. But um, I also, I really admire how it's, how it tries to use the trick-taking formula to give players actions. Because when you get a hand in Brian Brew, I love the calculation. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in fact, my favorite part of ARCs is when every player gets dealt their hands, everyone groans. And to me, that's good because it, you know, so much of, um, especially this is especially true in, in space games, 4X games, which are oftentimes engine builders, they're very triumphantist. You, you often feel very powerful at the end of the game. And I think, well, in actual good science fiction stories, players often feel powerless. Like you should get a hand and say like, oh, how am I gonna possibly get anything out of this hand? That puts you, you always feel like you're getting put on your back foot by the action system. And I think the game, uh, it makes the game a lot harder and also more narratively interesting um, yes. than, than I think other games in the genre. But that's, that's just kind of a brief overview. Yeah, but, but very, very fascinating. And uh, just um, going back to Brian Boru for one last uh, time here, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love Pear's work um, as well. And um, when we talked earlier today about it, I also said that Osprey, probably the publisher, did something here to, to make it, I, I thought to make it a little bit shorter. For me, yes. the story is not evolving in in a way that I'd love personally. I, I, yes. I, I'd like to play 30 minutes at least more, but probably yes. they said, well, it, it needs to fit into this 60 minutes uh, range. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, what do I know? So, yeah. and, and um, Mo has another question. So it's not necessarily on, on arcs, but he's uh, saying, Cole, how do you define a successful game? I assume the design brain and the business brain kind of fight each other. So, um, or do you have total freedom here, uh, Cole, that you're saying, no, business doesn't interest me that much. I need to, to <laughs> yeah. design this. Well, it, it, it's, it's a funny, it's a funny tension um, because I, I, I think that a lot of times when I'm looking at projects, even products that were really good, which is probably the place where I'm the farthest removed from actual market pressures. Uh, we are still thinking about the business plan. Um, the business plan keeps us in business and allows us to continue doing things. So, you know, I had, um, I, I was talking about um, uh, publisher business models with a fellow publisher uh, a few months ago, and they have a model where actually like 100% of the profit basically gets split up as soon as the game is published among everyone who helps. And it, compared to that model, I feel very conservative in our model because we, 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 we uh, structure things to, to withhold a fair amount of profits, but that's so we can stay in business and take yeah. risks. Um, and so, you know, whenever I'm looking at publishing a game, I always want it to be 
commercially successful because that's going to enable us to do bigger and riskier things. Every success buys you a couple of experiments, a couple of failures. Um, at the same time, one can design a business plan to determine the terms of success. Yeah. So John Company doesn't need to sell as well as Premier and certainly doesn't need to sell as well as Oath or, um, or Root. Mm-hmm. And, and it can still be a, a great success yeah. for us. Um, and, you know, so, but I'll give another example of, um, sorry, my children are playing in the room. Uh, I'll give you uh, an example of a, uh, of a way the business conversations come into, um, come into focus here. So with ARCs, we built this core chassis to play ARCs as a 90 minute game on a map about the same size as the root map with about as many wooden pieces. And we built that to actually test the campaign game, which mm-hmm. was what we had thought about at the time as the full arcs experience was this um, epic three game campaign where players basically, uh, oh, one second. No, no, no that's fine, Cole, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. I don't want you to hit a table. <laughs> Kids uh, always uh, take preference, so that's fine, no, no worries. Okay, uh, yeah, they're just, they're, they're, they're wrestling by, by the tables. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, so, um, we, we structured things though, like we had been planning on building this very big arcs experience. However, what we found was that the base game of arcs, that 90 minute game was actually really robust and interesting. We also found that um, when, we were, when it came to selling games, it was great to be able to offer someone a complete game that they could learn in one night, the same night that they bought it and play it. And then they could decide if they wanted to play the full campaign game. Now the full campaign of arcs Basically what it does is it strings games in these trilogies. You make these little trilogies. So you play a three game campaign um, and essentially you are drafting asymmetric factions. It's like uh, you are designing a root faction because the first game you played the Marquis, but you got kicked out of your kingdom and the second game you're a vagabond and the third game you lead an army and come back in, you're playing the Eerie. But you're not just the Eerie in the third game, you're the Eerie with a vagabond piece that can still build buildings like the cat. So you're, you're holding all of these powers. And so ARCs has, the campaign has these 24 plot lines. They can all interact with each other in interesting ways. They have different lengths. Um, that as a product, so I, I, the way I, I tend to look at it is I'm like, okay, well, as a design studio, as a designer, I'm designing this big campaign game, this core game, these tournament modes, all of these things around like the universe of the game. And then I have to take off my designer hat and put on my creative director hat and go into a meeting with the business folks and say, okay, how are we actually going to package this in a way that doesn't scare people f- away? Yeah. And, and you know, I know that on Kickstarter, for instance, when we raised money for ARCs, the vast majority of backers bought the whole suite. They wanted the campaign game. They perceived that as the true ARCs experience. I know that is not going to be true for most of the people who buy the game in its longer life. Um, and so we had to design a product line that has like multiple entry points and to do that without compromise, because I'm not interested in saying like, this is arcs as a demo mode, but I started thinking about a little bit like the advanced squad leader, like starter kits, Mm -hmm. like even if you adore ASL and I certainly adore ASL, um, I play the starter kit more than I play anything in beyond Battle. Um, so yeah, so that, that, yeah, that, that's just kind of, kind of an overview. Well, no, 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 that, that was a p- perfect example. And I think, uh, especially in crowdfunding, if you have a campaign game, yeah, and, and add it, people want this, people want this, even if they not necessarily playing all of this all the time. I think it's a, it's a really nice incentive and, and it, it's, um, it's, it, it's great. And Quality Beast Games is here, came in for Uli, stayed in for Worldly. So that is, uh, that is also a nice uh, compliment for, for you, Cole. And um, so ARCs is released in English language next year, right? Yep. When yep. is it about to, to uh, happen? So if you can already um, mention this, Cole. Yeah, so we are... We are uh sending files to the factory right now we're about halfway done and for a project that is this large um file submission will take about a month and a half two months uh you know with with smaller projects it doesn't usually take that long but there's just so much um we're hoping to have it 
in backers' hands by sometime in the first part of, of next year, and to be able to have it in retail channels by the end of by the end of next year, certainly. Um, and of course, uh, we will be preparing files for localization right afterwards uh, and, and getting all of that all of that going. Um, this uh, the project in some ways is so much uh, it's so much bigger than, than Oath. I hate saying that, <laughs> but, but, but it's true. I mean, it has uh, twice as many cards. There's a lot of interesting systems and elements to it. And so it was one that has taken a lot of time just on our back end, arranging everything uh, and, and making sure that we can kind of get it to the, uh, to the level of polish where we want it. Mm -hmm. But that sounds uh, sounds good. And, and, and from now, it's not that long anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so and I'm really personally, I'm really excited for, for this um, project. I have one more question for it, because when we last, uh, last year, when we talked at Conworks, I think we touched on it briefly because I saw in the background a stack of games and I'm not sure if it was Weapon Starship or Freedom in the Galaxy, some, yes. some old uh, games. So can you can you name one one game? I know this is terrible. Hard, sure, sure, okay. Hard, that influenced you the most in there or is it... I can and I'm, I'm going to get it right now. Because I can okay. It. Look at this. Oh. If I had to pick one, I would pick this game. Ah, Iberium, yeah, Iberium. Mark, um, Mark W. Miller. Mm. Yes, this is a this is a great design that mm. that has actually, in many ways, aged a lot better than other hex encounter games. Yes, um, but it has uh, it has a lovely campaign mode, where basically every game performs the kind of setup function for the game that's going to come after it. And you do get this sense of like drifting positions. And there's a lot, you know, if you really badly beat your opponent in one game, they're going to get some good advantages in the, in the next game that, that are going to kind of come up swinging around. Uh, and I just love how it uh, does storytelling. It also, it isn't a campaign that lasts forever. Uh, uh -huh. You can it sort of has like really lovely um, kind of curation. So the, that, that's been, that, that's been a big one. And then, I mean, there've been a lot of other games that, that, have, that have been important. I think uh, Freedom of the Galaxy. I mean, a lot of these games are not really playable. Yeah, like, Freedom of the Galaxy is a game that I, I think it, it's a fascinating design in its scope and ambition. It doesn't really work. Um, yeah. uh, it, only, only in a very hard way. Actually, when I played Early this year, I played Weapon Starship again from Kostikian, who is yes. a strange and interesting designer. And it's a three-player game. It's, it's just three-player. Mm -hmm. And it's from West End Games from the 80s. And actually, the game hasn't aged well. So, so oh, that's too bad. It, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it has some interesting elements, but still, we, we thought, uh, yeah, well, it, somewhat is missing here. Yeah, anyway, so... Um, Arcs is something that I'm also looking, of course, forward to as a publisher. So um, we will do the German edition. So I'm really looking forward to it. And Anne of Leader Games, she told me she's at Essen next next week yep. that she'll bring some uh, components to to you. So I'm I'm really oh, excited good. for this. So wonderful. Um, Cole, shall we bring in your brother? Is this Let's okay? Let's do it. Yeah, let's yes. let's do it. Somebody has to do it, right? So let's see where he is. So let's see if we find him. Drew, can you hear Hi, us? Ah, there you are. Why am I that big? That is strange here on my screen. I'm, I'm larger than you. So which is, which is, <laughs> apologies for, for this. It, it's not my fault, hopefully. So um, first, thank you for, for um, being a part now here of, of Conworks. And um, my pleasure having you here. You are running Drew um, Worldly Geek together with your brother, with uh, Cole. And... So first question to you, um, how was your year, so World Geeks year so far for you? 
Um, Uli, I'm not used to these questions of uh, reflecting so much uh, uh, in the middle of the afternoon. No, our year's been um, wonderful and wildly busy. Um, it feels like multiple years have been packed into this year. Um, I think Cole and I both share a similar sentiment. Um, but it's been building up uh, to a really exciting moment that we've been working with Joe on our upcoming game, Molly House, for months and months and months. And uh, so much great momentum came behind this game, especially in the last couple months, that um, we're finally bringing this project to crowdfunding this fall. So I'm going to say it's it's only ramping up to a really exciting end to the year is what's happening. So, so, uh, so excellent. Who of you both, who found Molly House? And, and please tell us uh, something uh, about the game then. Yeah, well, Cole, I think Cole's probably the best capable one for this one because you met Joe while they were making um, Molly House uh, in the earliest days for the Zenobia Award, right? Right. So this is a good time to, to plug the fact that starting on Monday, uh, the second... Oh, no, Sunday, sorry. The, sec the applications go live for the second Zenobia contest, uh, which we're very excited about. You know, the first contest... I. Um, it took a lot of resources to, to, to get running. And so I, it, it kind of feels like it's going to be sort of an every other year affair, at least for the short term. But the Zenobia contest is an initiative to find um, designers from underrepresented groups and subjects for uh, and underrepresented subjects for games and to uh, hold a design contest with a cash prize uh, to find the best of those games and to kind of help it get into publication. What is special about the contest, though, is that it's not just a contest. It includes a resource share, a community component, and a, um, a really large mentorship angle so that the people who are helping run the contest are kind of guiding these projects all the way through. Now, during the first Zenobia, I served as a mentor, and in my little mentorship pod uh, was a designer named Joe Kelly. And they were working on a design called Molly House, which is the one that Trudy and I are seeking to publish. And from the very first time I met Joe, I was very taken with their subject and very taken with their approach to the design. So Molly House is a game about the early 18th century, and it's about the um, existence, the construction of these queer communities in the early 18th century and their policing and eventual ru ruin. Um, it's a fascinating game, both as a um, meditation on queer histories, but also on more broadly, the history of cities, the history of policing. I mean, it, a lot of things are kind of bound up in that. And so over the course of the contest, I had to be very careful not to help them because I badly wanted to work on the design. But I thought, no, 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 I don't want to put my thumb on any scale. Uh, but when the contest was over, I did it. tell them like, look, you know, Drew and I are starting to think about doing other designs from new designers. If they would want to work with us, um, we'd be happy to entertain it. And I will qualify this by saying, and this is the other thing about this year is, we didn't really know what that meant. So I had to tell Joe very you know, forthrightly that I didn't know what it meant to collaborate on a project like this. And if they wanted to spend a few months experimenting to see if it worked, we would kind of wait to sign anything and we could just see what the working relationship might be. Hmm. And it's hard to say that we were really lucky, 18 right? months ago. Hmm. Yeah, right. That was 18 months ago. But also we've been really lucky that we liked, we really liked working with each other. And it became a really like intimate collaboration into development and design uh, where mentorship bled into working just really, really closely where we were uh, like both learning so much at the same time. Um, or all three of us. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's been a fascinating year. And I'm so glad that Molly House has taken everything from its initial conceit and seen so many different large swings in development over the last two years. Um, so we're really happy with what we're going to be bringing as our third title for Really Gig this fall. Wonderful. And um, first, uh, one step back, yes, I uh, totally... Um, um, I would like to confirm this is Zenobia Award, Zenobia Contest. This is a wonderful thing. I served as a mentor in the, during the first um, round as well. And the sheer amount of fantastic creative work you're seeing is outstanding. So really wonderful thing. Um, Drew, just a couple of basics on, on Molly House. So you said it will be crowdfunded this fall, yes. 
But the game, is it, or do, did we lose uh, Cole? Maybe. I, su I suspect Cole had to walk away from the computer for a second. <laughs> yeah, the, the kids were, uh, were there. So, um, Drew, my, my question is, playing time, number of players, so just the basics, so complexity oh, sure. level compared to John Company, to, to Pax Barmier? The, these, are, these are great points. So we are uh, currently working on a solo uh, right now. I hope we probably won't have it ready to share, but we want this game to be one through five. Um, right now, there's some really great ideas for making that those low player counts really, really good. Um, that are really interest that are like interesting. One through five. This is our entry level into uh, our our brand, so it's going to have a really accessible price point, and it's certainly our uh, less complexity overhead than Pax even Pax Premier. Um, I'm hoping that we can have time wise on this game anywhere from. 45 minutes to 90 minutes um and that's working on some of the complexity and some of the you know how long the games are going right now um and working on that too because that's you know length of the game is another barrier to entry um and i'd love for this to be our most approachable title uh yet um some of that also comes from the what the what the game looks and feels like i mean there's a single deck of cards that is like the, the mm -hmm. core element of play um in the game um so there's um and the, sh and the turns are significantly shorter than um than pax premier or john company it's just given the uh like the scale of the actions that you take um Uh, so we're hoping that like this is a, a game that's been needed in like the the worldly gig line for a while, and I'm really happy that it happens to be um, like coming from Joe and, and on this period. Um, so that's that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, you you are saying it has a, a single deck of cards, um, in, or it includes a single uh, deck of cards. Is it difficult or was it difficult to find good illustrations? Are you using original or, uh, illustrations? Are there a lot of existing uh, illustrations from the time? How did you approach it from, from that angle? Because, in my opinion, you can do a lot wrong easily here. Yes. Yeah, um, one of the... Uh, like most interesting points in this game coming from the art direction perspective is also imagining this game existing and being played and having its like na like meta narrative happening in these back rooms at Molly houses and this is the emerge this is a period where card games are emerging and we have a lot of incredible source materials of early playing card decks mm -hmm. from the late 17th and early 18th century and those are informing a lot of the art that we're working with to commission with a um, with an illustrator Rachel Ford who's doing a lot of uh, really exciting work um, um, and who's uh, Who has done our like mock-up cover um, that is on uh, that is that we're, that you might have seen uh, yeah. around yeah. Uh, so far? We're going to be working with uh, Rachel to do a lot of um, like drawings and illustrations of the Molly community because not a lot of that uh, was recorded and made into illustrious paintings or etchings uh, that were well preserved because this was an underground community. Um, thus mm -hmm. is like. The, some of the hard, the hard work that is talking about and researching queer histories is that there isn't a lot of well-preserved art uh, or even literature on, at that for source material. Um, but I think there's really great points for us to like integrate a lot of the historic art that is like a cornerstone of our games um, into the feel of it, yeah. while also making some of the scenes that are really particular to the Mali community, um, making sure that those are like have really great visual representation. Yeah, well, one and, thing that, that Drew and I have run into is the, the early 18th century is, is, a, is an amazing time for print culture. There is so much stuff, yeah. uh, but it is exceptionally easy to misuse it because mm -hmm. something designed as a broadsheet isn't going to look good as a background illustration. I always mm -hmm. think about th this is the, the problem of using paintings in card art. You know, a big historical painting, mm -hmm. you know, the Oath of the Horatii or something, is going to look horrible as a card um, because it's designed, you know, it's 12 feet long or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and so when, when, when we were working on Premiere, one technique that we use, because Premiere uses almost all historical art, is to make sure that the scale was roughly regularized. There are some exceptions. 
And then what I would do is say, okay, let's use as few artists as possible. And then we would cut out illustrations from the art, give them different backgrounds, do different color balancing to kind of like get them to look right. So it was one kind of cohesive whole. With Molly House, uh, we're doing a lot of sort of triangulation with source material, um, kind of secondary uh, history. And then of course, like the work of Rachel, um, who has an advanced degree in illustration who works in this period. Um, and so, you know, their work has just been fabulous. Um, and, and I think is, is making me want to, to work with more artists. Um, what, one other kind of funny footnote to all this is um, the, how, how the cards should look. So we, uh, the history of playing cards is one of the most well-documented corners of print culture. You can look up what decks looked like in 1680 and in 1710 and in 1712. And there are a lot of really amazing decks that we could have access to if we wanted to, to use as a basis. However, old playing card decks are bad. They do not work mm -hmm. as well as modern playing card decks. And I know that Fred Serval uh, had, had a bit of this problem with uh, the, the very simple Wist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Which has cards that look absolutely amazing in still photographs, mm -hmm. but don't look amazing uh, in the context of, um, of, 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 of what, what, what's being asked, what, what, what is being asked of them in the space of the game. Um, I actually think that Phalanx has done some interesting work on this with some recent things. I'm very excited about their new edition of Unhappy King Charles okay. because I, I saw it on the table at, uh, at UK Games Expo and how they were using the engravings was like very strategic and really, and really quite smart. And it's just really easy if you're going to use period art to assume that all the work has already been done for you when really like you have as much work to do <laughs> as, as if you yeah. were hiring those. Yeah, and then a quick sh uh, shout out to, to Fred here and uh, check out this game. I think it's in pre-order. Um, I missed the title, but it's on the English Civil War. It's again trick taking uh, in in a in a way, and it's uh, you can uh, check out Phalanx Games, a Polish company, and they have the game in in pre-order uh, right now. So uh, really, I can uh, recommend this highly. And there is a comment from the chat. Uh, hi Cole, Uli and Drew, looking forward to Molly House. Got interested after, after reading the articles in Conflict of Interests magazine. Greetings from Munich, yours Daniel. Daniel, I think uh, that is that Daniel that did an interview with you for Spielbox. Oh I'm yes, not, yes. I think so, I think so. Um, because Munich, um, that is probably the uh, connection. <laughs> So yeah, it's a small world here. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so I, I know this is terrible, terribly hard, but in a few sentences, can you describe a single player turn? So what am I doing when it's my turn in Molly House? Um, so I actually was, was just coming from a play test, so I feel <laughs> very well equipped to tell you what. So on your turn. Um, you'll take your player pawn and you'll move it to across the streets of London, moving a couple spaces away, and then taking an action that might be going cruising, where you'll play desire cards, vices from your hand that might score points, and then you'll draw cards back into your hand and you'll trash the cards that were played. Now, every time that you play cards and reveal them in front of you, You'll also be drawing additional cards or burning cards from the top of the deck. That might reveal a constable, which will tr could trigger an arrest. And those arrests means that you'll have to pull tokens from the bag, which are places where you'll lose victory points. But they're also opportunities for you if you decide to be coerced into becoming an informer. So a big cornerstone of the game is that it's a game about community and queer joy, mm -hmm. but also it's about the folks that were trying to uh, end that community as well. Mm -hmm. And, and, and no, please, please go well, on. And, and, and unlike a lot of other kind of hidden trader games, uh, this game is only opt-in. You only have to have that role if you decide that you want to take it. And as the game goes on, players will be like kind of increasingly pressured, especially mm -hmm. in certain circumstances, to sort of like flip, flip, flip the script. And then uh, the other kind of component of the game is um, one of the spaces on the map is the Molly House, Mother Claps, where you'll be attending parties. And the parties are resolved as 
uh, little mini games where players will play cards out of their hands together to try to collectively build what are essentially poker hands. And if they can build those poker hands, they will score points and kind of and, and sort of keep keep the house safe. But right. the parties are also places where players can be caught. Um, so there's a lot of um, it is very a very card forward card game. There's a lot of revealing and kind of showing people what, what's in your hand so that you can see like, all right, I've seen Drew. He's got a few eights. Uh, I've got an eight. Maybe we can try to do this party that's going to require three of a kind. And there's a lot of kind of inferences that can happen that way. It is one of those games where players are not allowed to talk about the contents of their hand um, because the joy of the play comes in the subtle hints and cues uh, that, that sort of naturally emerge as people play it. Mm -hmm. So, so, and then it's it's really so so sorry again for a very basic uh, question here. You play a single card, and this is not like in. Uh, Pax Pamir, for example, that you have several options with this card and it doesn't stay, so you use it once and then it's out. Did, did I get this correctly? Or It will often come back into your hand. Okay. So usually you will play a card and then it will come back into your hand. And so if you've been playing all of the cups suit, players know that you have an affiliation with that suit, that you're like building towards a particular okay. kind of hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it also means that you're more likely that you'll get caught for all of the cups. Um, so if I have some cups, I probably won't get caught for having them as well. Mm -hmm. So there's some like uh, risk management that's happening from mm -hmm. how much information is getting shared and navigating how you're kind of drafting and managing your hand. So, so how many cards are there included right now? I, so Sure, I, I suspect it'll be around 60 or so um, total cards, likely upwards to 70 or so. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I suspect, and you, you mentioned this earlier, because uh, you can play uh, John Company, also Solitaire, Solo Mode, uh, Pax Pamir, that it will include a Solo Mode, right? That's what we're hoping. This is why I, I suspect the total number of cards that we'll have in the box will be potentially up to 100, because the room for the Solo Mode, I want, you know, it's a deck of, a small deck of cards can do a lot in terms of generating some noise that makes it a, a robust experience for a solo opponent. Um, and it's been great to work um, with, uh, with Ricky Royal over the last few weeks on creating some prototypes of what the Solo could look like and how it could feel. Um, Uh, so we're hoping to like suss that out a bit more um, over the over the coming weeks. But um, uh, well, I've always uh, these are always funny projects when we we pitch them to to Ricky because I feel like we only give him hard assignments where we say John Company's a negotiation game. Do you want to try to make a negotiation solo game? And with Molly House, it's Molly House is a hidden trader game. Do you want to try to make a solo hidden trader game? Um, and and that. One thing I like about working with Ricky is that uh, that that prospect kind of excites him, um, and and so we we will see if it ends up being fully feasible. But I think we are planning. Mm. It's looking good so far. Yeah, and, and and Ricky, of course, is one of the best uh, doing solo yeah. modes. So so that is uh, wonderful. And Meeple Pete is saying risk management is always a nagging decision for a mind looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There you are, and, and you, you see, and uh, some people are saying uh, just uh, it's sometimes it's luck. No, it's risk management. So uh, that's yep. what it is. And, yeah. uh, and we're trying to put it as risk management in the in in the terms of not your economic growth, but rather your potential to create joy, and that's mm -hmm. like the cornerstone of this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it has. I mean, I, yeah, it's risk management in in a, like a downward trajectory too. Like there is like your hands tend to kind of fall apart. Um, it has a, it's a very fast game. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that, that I have liked about it and that people have been very surprised that it you know it takes an hour mm -hmm. and it has a very, very quick clip to it. Um, and so that, that from my perspective, um, just as someone who likes to play historical games, when, when you get a historical game that does play quickly, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to, uh, to, to Pierre's King of Siam, mm -hmm. um, I, I must have played that game 30 times in the first month that I had it or something. Mm -hmm. Because you could play two or three times in a sitting And it was so lovely. It's so lovely, I think, to find a historic subject that is being approached with like a lightness of touch that yeah. says, "Look, you don't need like this game is treating the history seriously. You, you don't need a full afternoon to play it." And I, I think it, uh, in some ways, it's very different from games that Drew and I have done. But in other ways, it feels like it ex it's exactly the sort of stuff that we that we're normally up to. It's just done in a slightly more approachable framework. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah, but but it feels uh, so. Uh, looking at Molly House from the outside and knowing what Whirligig did uh, earlier, so it feels like something that is a natural addition. It doesn't feel odd at all. So, and if you are saying it's a little bit more approachable, that doesn't change that it's, in my opinion, looking at it from the outside, that it's a perfect fit. So, um, so I think uh, that's, that's wonderful. And by the way, for, for people who would like to know more about the game also, I think it's on your website at Whirligeek. There is more info, of course. And at BGG, I, I read the designer notes of at least parts of it are already up there. So there is more if you look at BGG and if you look at, uh, at Whirligeek's uh, website. So there, yeah, wonderful uh, stuff. Of course, uh, yeah, before we go to, to this, um, so do you know already when it will be crowdfunded and at which platform or which platform you are you are using? Yeah, so just just uh, this week, uh, this past week, did we announce that on October 17th, we're launching this on BackerKit's new crowdfunding platform. So we've been uh, working with BackerKit for uh, since we've started um, on their pledge manager side of things, um, but they just started uh, doing a crowdfunding, the first part of the campaign that has typically been on Kickstarter for us. So a lot of our backers have used BackerKit before and are well familiar with all of those tools. Um, we really like that platform. Um, this is our first time doing a non-Kickstarter crowdfunding mm -hmm. event. Um, and it's been great to work really closely with that team on getting this plat getting the project ready. Um, uh, but October 17th, so we're a little a uh, little more than two weeks away. So exciting time. So and to, just to repeat it, October 17th, Molly House Backer Kit crowdfunding plat platform. If you do not have experience with Backer Kit, yes, they are great uh, as a pledge manager. But recently, for a couple of times, months, I think a year or maybe 18 months, they are also running um, um, crowdfunding uh, campaigns. So great people, really highly uh, recommended. And of course, I now, because people are asking me, uh, me, uh, me this all the time, I have to ask you about an infamous traffic. So I now, it's, I know you hate this question, question but... <laughs> FAQ question. Uh, yes. Um, I, so Molly House is, um, I hate saying it, but it is fairly close to being done. There is, this is a cursed statement because I usually say this and then something takes an extra six months. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but Molly House, there are things um, that, that still need some work, but we're very happy with, with how the design is going. I suspect it's going to be mostly through development by the end of November or December. And at that moment, I go to infamous traffic. It is the, it is the next thing on my list. I, uh, I don't want to put it off any longer. I think I have, I have a sense of how I want to approach the subject and I have a reading list of new scholarship that I have not, I have not looked at yet. Um, and I'm, I, 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 I have a very firm sense in my mind of how I want it to like look and feel. Um, you can see my children playing back there. <laughs> they do not oh, bother right. me like at all. Kids are kids and preference okay. there. So that's fine. No, no worries. One of the, the kid size really big shirts on. Um, but infamous traffic is, is basically at, at the top of the pile. And so we had, you know, at the very start of this year, Drew and I had a little, a little uh, online event where we talked about things that we were working on. And indeed, all of those projects are in some stage of, 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 of completeness. We, we don't know yet um, precisely when uh, we'll be doing our next project after Molly House, but it'll be infamous traffic. And then there's another game that we have signed, but I don't think we've announced quite yet. No, so, so you can I'm announce it right now, so nobody <laughs> is. is uh... <laughs> um, likely, I think we're likely going to be announcing it probably towards the end of the Molly House campaign. But it's not infamous traffic; it's another project, um, and that project will probably be done on the same timeline as infamous traffic. Okay. Um, so we, we, you know, it's, we've had a very busy year getting Molly House ready, and next year is going to be even busier. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but sounds uh, sounds great. And uh, Meeple Pete had uh, commented, wow, happy Uli is happy, sees a smile, yes, and I am. <laughs> so uh, with news of an, an infamous traffic and the third project, um, 
as well. And um, Daniel is saying, please let it be sacred band. So maybe he knows it. So, so <laughs> sounds good there. <laughs> Um, and uh, Mibra Peter is also saying, the yes, sacred band is something where the theme got me. So, yeah, it could be really, uh, they could be right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's uh, see. And um, with this, I would like to bring this slowly to an end. And as always, so first, Thank you to all the viewers, listeners for today, for our converts. Thank you very much. And I hope to see some of you. I know Meeple Pete I'm seeing. Um, and next week at Spiel Essen. I will miss you, Drew. I will miss you, Cole. And um, maybe, hopefully, uh, maybe you're thinking about attending LeriaCon in Portugal in March if you have time. And this is a wonderful convention, my number one uh, convention in the world. I know it's a little bit more difficult to, to fly over from, uh, from the US. And I think it's, always a, uh, it's also the perfect place to test games because there are mm. lots of knowledgeable players, but it's a quieter, smaller environment. There are not thousands of people and uh, there's nothing else, just the Atlantic, the players, and you are in Portugal with the nicest people uh, around. So I had to say this because I'm missing you at Essen. And there are a couple of um, comments here in the chat, so we cannot end this. Um, so let's see. Uh, Karthik is saying thank you, Cole and Drew. So yeah. Mo, I have a question about the arti uh, artistic style of Molly House and John and John Company. It is clear that an infamous traffic is a postmodernistic view. Um, you say that Molly House and John Company are postmodern. Is this is this true? Yeah. I don't um how could they? I, I don't think they could be any. Well, actually, oh man, that's what, what this is, is an interesting question. question. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I mean, it, Mo it, all, it, always with these complex yeah, sorry, questions. If John it, Company it's a is nightmare. postmodern, if John Company is postmodern, it's postmodern in the same way that Tristram Shandy or Tom Jones might be postmodern, which is to say, it is so, it is so baked in kind of 18th century humor and sensibility, which is almost periodless. Uh, it, it's almost w w without period. Um, infamous traffic is is a little stranger, but I, I think actually the, I think that all those stories are novelistic. I mean, the kindest thing that I hear about John Company is when people tell me that they feel like they just played through an 18th century novel or a 19th century novel, mm -hmm. because that because to me those those are games that are using those narrative conventions. At the same time, the approach to scholarship is entirely post-colonial. Those games are built with with modern theoretical frameworks, but in terms of their storytelling, um, there, I mean, John Company, the, the novelist of adaptation of, of John Company is something like Barry Lyndon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You, know, it, it, you, you, you want something that is, that is rambunctious and picaresque and silly, but also sort of tremendously grave and serious at the same time. And I think, uh, that that can be a hallmark of postmodernity too, but uh, that isn't what we're drawing on necessarily. Okay, okay, makes so sense. That's Mo, answer. Mo, next time, other questions. This is yeah, horrible. I'm gonna forward that to my graduate this is, advisor. This that's is probably horrible. Worth so, so again, <laughs> this is. I think that's a great horrible is a great last word for 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 Conworks. No, it was my pleasure here. I enjoyed this tremendously. Thank you so much, uh, Drew. Thank you so much, Cole, for making a time to all the viewers and I try, I try to move some of the videos to YouTube before Essen, but you know, Wednesday morning, I'm already moving to Essen for a setup for other things. So I cannot guarantee it. It might be the week after Essen. So thanks a lot. Have a great day over there. Have a great evening yes. over here and till next time. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, Bye you so thank you again. Bye.